All right, we are back. So, um, because it was Hell in a Cell, I feel like a history of cage matches is due in order with it, and I found some great information regarding this. So, uh, we got to get started with kind of our first little indication here, if I was ever prepared, but clearly I'm not because I am an idiot. So, the first cage match. So the first official cage match was, I do have some notes here actually, on January 9th, 1936 in Carisville, Missouri, and it included a chicken wired fence match. So the picture that you see there, this was not the official match from 1936, but they built it very similarly to this. So what they did was that they built the ring intentionally larger to fit the cage that you see here. And this is what it looked like. They actually had it in a dome shape in the middle of the ring without anything else around it. And clearly with this, the parameters were very interesting because it almost cut the ring down in half to what it was. And they used chicken wire because number one, it was the cheapest kind of cage thing available. But the problem was, is that it hurt. If you ever ran into some chicken wire, it is thin. And when you go full force into something that is thin, um, the surface area is going to break up a little bit, which means you're gonna get cut easier, which is why they always be say careful of a razor blade. It's sharp, yes, but that's just because the surface area is so much thinner that your skin does not have enough to kind of stretch around it. Mm -hmm. So they used chicken wire in this match in 1936. It was between Jez um, and Odo Lundring and Joe Dillman and Charles Shinsky. And it was surrounded by chicken wire and the athletes were inside to prevent any potential interference. Now, that was not the only reason for this. And we actually do have to talk about one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time right here. If you don't know who that is, that is a young Mae Young. So here's the thing. Mae Young, for pretty much the majority of her prime career in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, just keep in mind of how old this woman was. She was like 95 when she died. Um, she, was, she played a heel, and she, was, she loved playing a heel. She always said that any wrestler could play a good, clean wrestler, but it takes talent to be a bad guy. She was so hated. Because number one, she took on um, people like your um, June Byers and your, which we'll actually talk about here when the NWA does their all women's event, um, their June Byers and your Mildred Burks. Just keep in mind of how old fucking Mae Young was. Mm -hmm. She was so hated that they actually had to pretty much put chicken wire around the ring for every single one of her matches, not because it was a stipulation, but people would throw into the ring rotten eggs and vegetables because they thought Mae Young was trash. So they would do that on purpose to not only protect her, but um, to keep the ring as clean as possible when Mae Young did a match. Now, luckily, Mae Young actually drew huge money back in the 30s and 40s, so she was pretty much always main event. Just keep that in mind, too. So this never really became an issue, but they did this for the safety. So on September 29th, 1942, was the first international cage match that I could possibly find. Um, it was in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and it was John Cratton fighting and defeating Iglesio Martinez in the first ever six-foot-high steel cage match to um, ever exist in record. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and also, this one had steel bars, not chicken wire. So after, actually, that was only the first recorded indication of iron bars at this time. It didn't take until 10 years later for this to be the industry standard. So at this time, chicken wire was still the premier way of using um, steel cage matches, at least for that time. 
until the 1960s. Mm-hmm. So the 1960s, um, they had, which is actually what I have here. It wasn't this match, but it was between the same people. And this introduced um, wire fencing. So the difference between wire fencing, so I'm not sure, peanut gallery, it was like the two, like the larger blocks of wood and then that little like wire fencing stuff that they have in like your standard fence. Okay. They changed it to that from chicken wire because it was thicker. Ah. It was safer for the wrestlers. And also that was when it was first introduced in the 1960s. So like a chain link fence. Um, not chain link yet. So um, it was, so, okay, um... Trying to find an example. So when we were in school, they had that lower fence. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so it was the wood, and then they had, like, the two wood things right. um, across. But then they also had the um, – they also had that, like, right. wire, that um, that wired fencing around it. That's what they used. Mm. Um, because not only was it thinner, so it was safer for the wrestlers, but then it was introduced in the 1960s, so they used it then. Ah. Yeah, so this this match right here was the first one that introduced this, and this was Doc and Mac Gallagher versus Guy and Joe Benitti. So both of them were actually pairs of brothers. Uh, the Gallagher brothers won the match, and I really couldn't find any information regarding the promotion on this. But it did take place in Cleveland, Ohio in, I think it was 1964. Four, um, but I found a couple of different dates for the actual match itself, so it was kind of hard for me, which is why I said the 1960s. So from that point, um, from then on, it was either chicken wire, fencing wire, and iron bars that were used interchangeably depending on the budget of the promotion using um, that particular um, type of match. Right. On September 24th, 1979, WWE were the first ones to introduce their own version of the cage match. It was still not um, the chain link or mesh that we know now. It was still wire. And it was between Bruno San Martino and Lou Albano for the WWF champion very early on. Obviously, I think you know the fucking winner of this because I don't believe um, Albano ever won the champion in the WWF. Right. So after that, WWE introduced the chain link fence that oh. we know now. So this came about when Bob Backlund was champion. So this was in 1982 when the chain link was introduced into the promotion. Right. Not only was it actually cheaper to make this and keep it around for longer, it was safer for the wrestlers, it was easier to assemble, but it looked better on television. So Bob Backlund actually had a number of steel cage matches defending the champion. He defended it against people like Sergeant Slaughter and the Iron Sheik and your general wrestlers that would face against a babyface Bob Backlund. And um, also the first match that actually had the chain link was between Backlund and Pat Patterson. Mm. So, and Backlund obviously retained that title. And here's the thing. Um, steel cage matches were not only introduced as the ender of a rivalry, but it introduced the beginning of very major rivalries. And the best example of this was uh, Christmas Day in 1982, Dallas, Texas, huh. WW, or the NWA World Heavyweight Champion match between Kerry Von Erich and Ric Flair, hometown for Kerry Von Erich, with uh, Michael P.S. Hayes as the guest referee. Now, this match is significant because not only they were in Texas, not only did Ric Flair win, but Terry Gordy actually interfered on Flair's behalf, slamming the door right. into Von Erich. And this kicked off the rivalry between the Von Erichs and the Fabulous Freebirds. Here's the thing. Why this, um, why this rivalry was so hated? It was not just because it was the hometown boys versus the Georgians. The problem was is that the Von Erichs used the flag of Georgia. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was a symbol on that flag that was very controversial even to this day. Right. Peter Gallery, I want you to answer this. This is the early 80s. What was on their flag? The Confederate combat flag. Oh. So they would wave the Georgia flag in Texas 
going against the Von Eriks in the WCCW promotion. So if you want to talk about nuclear heat, try, they could not, security had to be in the building at all times because there were bomb threats and bombs actually sent to hotels and to the building to stop the dastardly Freebirds. If you want to talk about mega heat, that's mega heat. Oh, yeah. So um, that's always fun. And obviously, we if, if you want to talk about famous cage matches, you cannot talk about famous cage matches without talking about Don Morocco versus Jimmy Superfly Snuka, no. where Snuka flew off of the top of the cage with a Superfly splash for the Intercontinental Champion back in 1983. And it like this really took cage matches to a whole new level because nobody in the entire history of cage matches from the 1930s up until now actually jumped off of the top of the cage for an attack, right. ever. It never happened. So this was very significant in what they could do with this. And it really gave a lot of promoters definite opportunity for different stuff. Right. To spur Now, at this point, the concept of the cage was not becoming as um, prominent of like a major television draw. So WWF decided to do something a little bit different. Not only did they get rid of the mesh cage, at least for the time being, because number one, actually, um, start people started to get bothered by the color of it because it was a little hard to see, but they also replaced it with the blue iron bars. Right. And obviously, if you're talking about mid to late 80s, early 90s cage matches, especially in WWF, you think about the blue iron bars, um, which number one, spaced things out a lot more so people can see, but also it was a different color than your standard black and silver. Right. So actually it really cooled down for everybody that they could see. I kind of wish they'd actually bring something like this back, but that's hearsay, I guess, especially with Hell in a Cell now. Uh, the first match that actually introduced these was the WrestleMania 2 match between Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy. And trust me, I checked everywhere. This was the first one that I could find right. that had this. Speaking of different concepts for steel cages, ah, yes. we have had everything at this point. You, We had um, the Asylum match in TNA, Six Sides of Steel. Uh, we had barbed wire fence cage matches, your chicken wire, your wired. But let's talk about war games. This was a brainchild from Dusty Rhodes who got influenced with this with the Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome uh -huh. um, cage concept where everybody was surrounding the cage and it was domed on top. Right. And that's where we actually got this idea. They added in the two rings to really spruce it up even more so because actually um, Memphis Wrestling used a one cage with a roof on top concept for at least 10 years before this happened. So Dusty Rhodes wanted to do something different. And if you, th if you believe that the War Games matches were only on pay-per-views, you're actually mistaking quite a bit. So the first one was in the Omni in Atlanta for Great American Bash in 1987. And actually, the entire tour starting at the Omni at the Great American Bash had war games matches. So even before they reached the 90s, there were five war games. And, th and four of them were actually on house shows. They weren't even on pay-per-view. Huh. Yeah. So obviously there was one at the Miami Orange Bowl. Chicago had one at the UIC Pavilion um, and other NWA debuts at the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island. So... Really, it was just kind of there. And then also the rematch at a house show in 1989 at the Omni happened again. But that was, once again, at a um, house show. Right. WCW used it originally in 1991 at War and five house shows in 1991's Great American Bash Tour in 1992 at Wrestle War again before it was a traditional fall brawl thing between 1993 and 1998. So just like what you see with NXT TakeOver War Games, you had Fall Brawl being the general place for a right. War Games match outside of the Great American Bash. 
So I wanted to end this, and when we talked about different versions of cage matches, I want to talk about Hell in a Cell. Because obviously Hell in a Cell just happened not too long ago, and it just makes sense to kick finish off a wrestling lesson with this. The concept of Hell in a Cell is unclear between two writers that are very well known at this right. time. Jim Cornette and Vince Russo, who actually contend with themselves. So Jim Cornette claims that the cage is a combination of the cage of the Memphis Championship Wrestling cage and the War Games cage that he came up with. And he also said that he came up with the name of uh, the actual match itself. Vince Russo claims that the creative team wanted to do Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker in a cage match, but the problem is that limits Shawn Michaels' arsenal because Shawn Michaels was a get-on-the-top-rope-and-fly outside competitor even as a mega heel that he was. So they came up with this, so Shawn Michaels still had the ability to do this. And he did claim that he came up with the name Hell in a Cell, but Jim Cornette disputes that for obvious reasons because of their tumultuous relationship, right. um, you know, put to a better name. So um, at Bad Blood between Shawn Michaels and Undertaker is obviously a classic, um, not only because of the match itself being the first Hell in a Cell, but the debut of Kane. And obviously that's there. But there have been a lot of great Hell in a Cell matches and some infamous ones. If you want to talk about famous ones, let's talk about um, Undertaker and Big Boss Man. Let's talk about Triple H and Cactus Jack. And obviously, you cannot talk about Hell in a Cell without talking about The Undertaker versus Mankind at King of the Ring 1998's Hell in a Cell. You just can't. Right. But there have been infamous ones as well. And one of them I really wanted to talk about that they just did way too much on was the Kennel from Hell match huh. between Al Snow and and Big Boss Man. Because not only did they do, do the Hell in a Cell here, but they also did a cage inside of the Hell in a Cell. And what they did is that they surrounded the ring with dogs. Dogs. Like Dobermans and shit. Huh. The, the, um, the original intention was that these were going to be trained police dogs, but they did not have... Um, they didn't have the time to do that, so they actually just got trainers to bring in dogs. Unfortunately, the dogs could not give enough of a shit. Well, one of them shit at ringside, right. and then they all started humping each other because they are Rottweilers. Huh. Well, number one, get them spooted or... Um, uh, spooted? Spooted. Um, spayed or neutered. <laughs> um, but... It was just a very infamous Hell in a Cell match. And obviously, uh, you can't talk about an infamous Hell in a Cell without talking about Seth Rollins and Bray Wyatt, where it ended at a disqualification. Uh, so, uh, kind of the end of the day, I really wanted to bring this up because Hell in a Cell and all cage matches have such a great history, rich in tradition, rich in different promotions, a lot of different trial and error stuff from right. what we saw with fucking chicken wire to right. the red cage that we see now and at the very least we at least have this instead of the chicken wire um pina do you have anything to add before we make pro wrestling majestic again nope all right so when we come back not only are we going to make wwe and hell in a cell majestic but pro wrestling majestic again